Hi, kitty cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you already subscribe, thank you very much. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other content like writing and other podcasts by our contributors, please consider subscribing using links you're going to find in the show notes. Well, today I am here with a good friend of mine, Tucker Lieberman. Hi, Tucker. Hello. Thank you for having me, Amethysta. So, oh, no, thank you, for, thank you for coming because, like, I know, for, so first of all, I know you through Medium. That's, that's the main thing which is where I know like half the people I ever talked to. But what, stri- what has always struck me about your writing is how philosophical it is. There's always this, um, like this under, undercurrent of, like I don't even know. It's like reading a, um, it's, like a, it's like opening up, you know, I can't even say the name, but it's like Jean-Paul Sartre opening up one of his books. That's, that's like the level of thoughtfulness that I see in in your writing so that's that's you know Thank you. i've always loved reading you so um you have written at this point hundreds of stories um and i know many many blog posts uh on your website as well as on medium and both of those will be linked in the show notes but you and i started talking in particular about um creativity really and I know at least my gender transition was somewhat uh, was difficult. Like even when it's easy, I don't I don't know because um, Tucker, you are a transgender man, yes. right? Okay. So even when we have good support networks, even when we have good access to gender affirming care, there's still a lot uh, involved in this. And, and one of the the biggest, at least for myself, that I I'm still going through is just like figuring out, you know, who we are, who I, well, who I am anyway. I think I know who you are, maybe, but, and so I we need, I too, but we're still getting to know each other and ourselves. Wouldn't, right. But see, you know, like after a year or something, you go, oh, I don't know myself pretty well, but I don't think that's true. I think, um, it's really easy not to have, uh, not to, not to know what tools to use in order to, to develop you know, the identity. So, or, you know, your identity. So can we actually just start off? I mean, I'm just, you know, you've been writing for a long time, I know. And can you just tell me first about your writing journey? I mean, that's, I know that's very vague, but that's kind of where I, where I start. (laughs) Sure. Well, it's something I've always loved to do. And my first interest was in poetry, just because I liked the sounds of Mm -hmm. words. And I aspired to write more prose, but my prose was always kind of disjointed. Um, It was more like an aspiration rather than anything I did particularly well. Okay. And I guess um, I did it well enough to impress some teachers, but I didn't really feel that I had a craft or that I was able to say what I wanted to say. And after college, I ended up taking a job at a tech company. It was technically an investment company, so it was finance and technology. And I learned how to write business emails, Mm. but I didn't really have any time to work on my creative projects. Um, I would try, you know, I would try really hard to carve out a few hours on the weekends, but it just, it wasn't quite ever possible and I couldn't reach whatever level I was aspiring to. And, you know, finally I left that job for various reasons and I started writing full time. And, you know, that was transformative for me because when I finally got the time to focus on what I was trying to say, I could just open up that depth and explore my capabilities and get a lot of feedback and really hear the creative feedback for the first time. So since then, that was in late 2017. So six years now, I've been devoting a lot of my time to writing and that has been great for me. Do do you write, um, I mean, I want to use the word professionally, but that doesn't, I mean, do you have like clients for whom you write 
like targeted material? Yeah, I do in various ways. I okay. write for a website that is not my own. Um, beyond Medium, I, I write for mm-hmm. an app. And I have for several years been writing book reviews professionally. Oh, okay. Although I okay. recently cut back on that um, just to make more time for other things. And, and sometimes people come to me for help writing their books, which I love to do. I love right. to give feedback on people's manuscripts. Have you, because actually, I'm not, do you edit at all? Have you been an editor? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I always have ideas. So oh. if, if people want to rope me into that, I'm happy to help. Yeah, absolutely. And there's contact information on, on your website, right? There certainly is. There you go. So you. a good, a good plug. So. So I know you through writing, but you sent me a link that has, I'm not even sure, it's probably 50, 60 photos in it, right? That one, it was your journey through the summer of 2017, was it? Yeah, that photo essay I posted to Medium, right? Yes, yes. It was around the time I left my job, so I was explaining that in photos. Yes. It it was amazing, but... It was amazing, I guess, to see, you know, your, your, the process, I suppose. So it wasn't quite writing, but it, but it wasn't, you know, you weren't quite trying to make a movie. It was like this sort of melange. I'm not French. I don't know how to speak, how to say that, but, you know, um, a recipe. It was just, there you go. It was a recipe with some really interesting, I mean, like what got you into that? Does it was, you say for, you don't do much with photography, but. No, I feel like I don't spend a lot of time planning photos or thinking about what to do with them. But sometimes I just like to have my phone in my pocket and I take a little interesting photo when I'm passing by something because it's it's not that it means anything specific to me necessarily, but but something about it catches my eye. Right. And, And if I absorb something that looks very unusual then I'm always going to remember where I was when I saw that and approximately yeah. when it was and how I was feeling and who I was at the time I saw it. So it might be an acorn, for example, and it's a little mm-hmm. spiky hat acorn that I haven't seen before. And I say, wow, how cool is that? And and that's gonna that image is going to be very connected with my emotions at that moment because I must have been in some reflective space that caused me to notice the acorn. So I somehow that, that connects and fuses and is always there. So that image of the acorn is my own personal symbol for whatever inward contemplation I was in at that moment. Right. You know, I, I mean, I never intended to talk about that at all, but that like, that seems like the, the appropriate use of, of like photography. I mean, cause I'm sure you, you you know you can go to the park and there's like a parent you know watching watching his or her kids you know and that's the whole thing, they're not participating at all they're just they're taking photos that they can upload to Facebook and go, look this is me having a life and you go I, are you really having a life because all you're doing is holding like looking at it through your phone, so is that is that a life at all, um, but when it turns into a contemplative exercise, I mean that sounds perfect not you know selfies with a statue of liberty or something you know not that i've done that more than twice so i I probably have one selfie with the statue of liberty (laughs) right i know everybody does i mean it's (laughs) you get near it you're like you know trying to do the bunny ears yeah so she's already posing yeah, it's kind of perfect, right? I mean, you know she's posing. Like there was there was nothing else for her but, you know, posing that one thing. She's got the the book and the the torch and, you know. So, but I but I I figure, I mean, you had the one so the photo what did you call it? The photo journalism of your photo story. Essay. What did you just call it? So yeah, photo essay. Um it's it's I mean, it it really Ooh, what's the word? I had it in my head and then I lost it. Like it, it documents kind of this process of evolution where you were going from, you know, one job to in, into, you know, your own creative endeavors. 
I mean, I think that's I think that's interesting. Just the ability to use creativity to to remember who you are and remember where where you are. Um, but but to get more into the topic that that we were talking about, because you had mentioned um, a group that used art for for exploring, you know, yourself. Um, and, and we don't have to talk about the particular group, but I'm curious how, like, what, like, what's the role that that creativity has played in in your own journey? I guess at the early stages, when I was, say, a teenager, or even in my twenties, it was it was very aspirational. Like, I thought of myself as a creative person, but my output was actually very small. Or when I did write something, it didn't make any sense. Or when okay. I drew something, it was like, why am I drawing that? Um, so that in itself was like an identity, like my identity as a creative person, because the identity came before the real output. I see. And I had to figure out why I had such a strong sense of myself as a writer in particular, when actually I was not having a lot of time to type or not having much success when I was at the keyboard. But I think but I think that identity as an artist or a writer is important because you kind of have to believe in yourself first. Um, I think people have different journeys with that. Like some people will say, oh, I, I really don't think of myself as a writer, but, but they produce amazing things when they give themselves the time to do it. Right. Um, for me, having the identity as a writer, I think, has been something I wrestled with a little bit because I realized I did have to give myself space to do the kind of writing I needed to do. You know, when I first left my job and I was just taking time off and I didn't really know what I was going to do, there was a time, it was several weeks or maybe even several months, when all I wanted to do was walk around the neighborhood and take pictures of ladybugs and daffodils and try to be in this meditative space. Yes. I, I'm grateful to have had that time. And I think it helped a lot, like just to assure myself that I was okay, even if I wasn't producing a massive amount immediately. Just say, okay, this is my time to sort of look inward and see what's there and see what my capabilities are. And if mm -hmm. what I want to do is just take a few photos of nature and then filter them on my computer and just play with things, I can have this time to play. And when I quiet down the expectations, we're going to see what rises up. And what rose up were a bunch of books. So it came eventually. But, th but that's been a process of like negotiating with myself whether I have the time to devote to this and really being patient sure. with myself. So, so that's interesting. I mean, you you went out and did it without a purpose, really. And that's what helped you kind of discover the purpose. If, am, I, am I saying that well enough? Yeah, and I've never really thought about it that way before, but I think that is my relationship to the little bit of photography that I do. Yeah. My writing has a purpose. I always know what I want to say. Mm -hmm. But but my visual art really doesn't. Like just once in a while I just want to loosen up and play with something. And right. the easiest way for me to do that is with a camera because I I notice all kinds of interesting things visually. So I'm like, let's just go out and you know, look at the graffiti or or look at the pattern of sand or wind or rain or whatever it is. Sure. And I take a picture of that and I play with it and I don't know where it's going, but then like sitting with that unknowing and openness adjusts something inside me energetically. And then I'm like, okay, now I can sit down and write the specific thing that I want to write, which does have a goal. Oh, so, oh my gosh. So it's, I mean, so it's like two different media even. So mm -hmm. you take photography with no, no like specific purpose that allows you to get into the creative state for writing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's so. fascinating. Oh, that's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. I would never have thought that. I wonder if that's it's different cool. for different people. Like, it's, yeah, because usually what happens, if I'm going to write an article and I have nowhere near the output 
that you do. But usually when I'm writing an article, I will wake up and you know how you're in that, there's a word for it, hypnagogic, I think is the word for it. You're in that state. Yeah. That's usually where my, where my best ideas come from. So I'll start thinking through something and I'll go, oh, this is really profound. And then I'll, I'll pull out, you know, a notebook. I always have a notebook by my, um, by my dad, uh, my bed. I don't sleep at my desk. I mean, sometimes, um, <laughs> But then I'll sit there and I'll, I'll jot down some notes and, you know, take a shower or whatever. And, and, and it turns into, OK, I could make this. Is, I'll think of jokes is <laughs> actually almost half of half of how I write an article. So, well, this would be a funny joke to put into it. So so I don't know. And actually, I'm saying funny jokes. And there, I guarantee there's at least one person out there who's going, I don't think I ever saw anything funny come out of her. So. <laughs> You need to think a little harder. But um, anyway, that is fascinating. Um, I, I do want to, because you've written a ton of fiction as, as well, right? I have written some fiction, in particular, one big novel. So I feel okay. like that one big novel is a ton of fiction. Right. It is to me. I mean. Like, I have it here, and you can see the physical size. Oh, gosh. Because, and this... This cover, by the way, I want to tell you, is by Cell La Flaca. Um, but this is an oversized book. It's a mm -hmm. square. Yeah. So I feel like this is a physical quantity of fiction. Oh, very much. That's that's a ton to me, but because um, I keep wanting to sort of sort of you know jam on this issue. I don't know if I want to use the word jam, but not issue. This this thought. That using fiction is is a way is a way for us to kind of play with you know to play with who we are. To I mean I've used the phrase try on identity and I don't know if that's a great way to put it, but it like to me any fiction I've written, which hasn't been much, has been you know I'm trying to be somebody else. I'm trying to well I'll rephrase that. I'm trying to be the person I wish I had been you know, 30 years ago or something. Did, does that, I mean, did you, did you do that? Did you put yourself into those characters and see the world from each of those characters' perspectives? Sort of. In, in a, a light sense, I think of the characters as being partly aspects of myself, but mm -hmm. also I try to imagine that there's a situation the exact contours of which I've never been in. And okay. also I start to imagine, well, what if I had different motivations? And what if I had a, a different perspective on things because I had a different lived experience? Right. And what if I were emotionally fired up about something and had less of a filter on my mouth and wanted to speak in some colorful language? About so it's, <laughs> the, the more I invent the situation, the farther away from me it gets. But I don't think of it as entirely putting on a costume and walking on stage and immediately trying to be some entirely other person. I think of it more as like just some different aspect of myself that I'm camouflaging or playing with or um, just presenting in a different way, just in a playful mm -hmm. way. And, um, and eventually as it gets more and more elaborate, it gets farther and farther away from me. But I... But I, I mean, I love, I love the way you you're putting that because I don't see like try on was not a great because I don't think it is a costume. I mean, I agree with you. I think it is an aspect of yourself that that you're like the way I think of it is it's an aspect of myself that I'm trying to express so that I can go. Do I like that aspect of myself? Would I want to integrate this into my you know my my normal life, whatever that means. Um, so that's that's why I think you know that's why I keep thinking about this this concept of using fiction or role playing, um, whatever it might be, um, improvisation. So so that you so that you try to see what you would look like in that situation, and I mean I think that's very important because you know a lot of us I don't know about you like I can introspect pretty well. Usually what I do is I look inside and then I hit myself with a hammer. <laughs> I, I don't know if that should be toward me as opposed to away, but 
you know, I look inside and go, oh, I hate that. But I know many people, you know, you, you ask them, did you, did you see what you just did there? And they go, no, what? And you can relate it back to them and they go, no, I didn't. I mean, you can like take a video of them and they go, oh, I mean, I guess, but, you know, not really. I think many people have no idea like what they're doing at any one time, which is a little creepy to think. But and so that's why I think role play can help out because you can go, well, look, you know, do it purposely. If you're going to be a jerk, like be a jerk purposely. If you're going to be submissive, be submissive purposely, at least for a moment, so that you can try it on and see what it feels like. <laughs> yes. Like last week, I was talking with a friend of mine, and one of the hardest parts of of like changing. The hardest parts for me of of uh, hardest part for me of transition was changing how I communicated. Because I was so used to being, you know, I had 25 years in software where I'm like, you go do this, you go do that, you know, don't, don't bother me, I'm doing something else. And except that was a lot of pointing and, you know, I, you know, I'd love to, to gesture and I didn't do that because it was like, well, that's not the way I'm supposed to, to act. So, mm. so changing that meant that other people saw me in different ways or in a different way. And, and that was difficult. But I think if I could have done some role playing, even if it was like with my family, like they could have seen that that different side. And then as I started to integrate it in, they would go, well, this isn't weird. This is just amethysta, which is a little weird, but who is a little weird, but I kind of prattled there. But but the idea of 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 playing with that is is very powerful, I think. Mm-hmm. Playing with a person you already are and yet could be the person you have to step into. Yes, right. But same as in fiction. I mean, I think if you're writing a character, it's it's kind of it's kind of similar to because uh, it's it ends up being an aspect of yourself. So I don't I think, know. I think it does. And what's come up for me right now is a recollection that back in the day, like before I transitioned or around the time I transitioned, Mm -hmm. um, there was a sense that if I'm transitioning to be a man, I'm going to be a man like other men, or that is the expectation, that is the ideal. So essentially I'm trying to be a cis man, even though... I can never be one. I'm only going to be a transgender man because that's what I am. Right. And so there was um, this this focus on the word only, like I'll only ever be transgender, as if that's some kind of diminished version of a cisgender person. Yes. You know? like, right. I'm not reaching some goal and I can't ever reach that goal. And I think that was part of what held back my writing. Like I... I wanted to write stories, but I felt like if, okay, if I'm writing a story, it has to be about cisgender characters. And, and I didn't have the word cisgender then. Um, Sure. People use the word like genetic or biological or even just like normal, regular people like men and women. Those are the people who are going to be in my stories. Right. Because my perception was that there weren't that many trans people and am I going to be out as a trans writer writing for a trans audience? Like that didn't even really occur to me that it was even possible. So I was just like, well, I'm just going to be a guy writing stories and they're going to be men and women in my stories and they will be cisgender. Yeah. And it was really hard to think of any stories to write. (laughs) And it took so many years to figure this out. But like if my lived experience is as a trans person, whether or not I'm out to the people around me, whether or not they realize I'm trans. Like, I am. That's my perspective. So that's got to be an important part of what I'm trying to say in my fiction. Right. My mm-hmm. And once I give myself the space to do that and just to be like, well, a character in my story can be trans, then it's going to open up so many possibilities because 
I'm going to feel a connection to that character and be like, oh, now I know what this character wants to say because they're a person like me. Right, right. Do, do you know, I, I actually, I don't know how much I want to say it like this. Like, I'm happy that you struggled with that. Be, with the only part. The, the, when you brought up the point where you said, I kept focusing on the word only, and that's exactly what I'm struggling with now. And it's nice to see, I mean, not nice, because it sucks, and it probably sucked for you. But it's nice to see that this is kind of a, you know, common, or, or you know, I hate using the word normal, but there it is. You know, it's it's sort of an experience that, that is typical to say, well, I'm, I'm only a transgender woman. I, you know, my real purpose was to be assigned female at birth and well, Mm -hmm. I'll settle for being transgender, but there's power in that to, to, I guess, just to accept yourself enough to say it's not only because, because there's not just cisgender. It's not only transgender there are there are both cisgender and transgender and both are great and that's Mm -hmm. that's been hard for me to to come to grips with too so did um did your writing help you process that in any way yes yeah in a big way i started off writing a book of literary criticism looking at Unix in fiction. Okay. Um, Unix from, you know, more than a hundred years ago, sometimes thousands of years ago. Sure, sure. Just seeing how they were depicted in fiction and trying to figure that out. Like, why are they so often villains? And as I wrote into that specific question, it helped me understand um, a lot of the origins of the ideas of, like, being half man, half woman. um, Yeah. The idea that you're only half of something, or that you're incomplete, or that you're injured, or you're modified, or you're trying to be something that you can't be, and how that gets associated with the idea of deficiency and evil, um, right? Trustworthiness, or or just like, or even pity, people pitying the eunuch, and so forth. And I and I wrote into this question, and it helped open up some space, right? Um, in sort of a meta way, because I was writing about fiction. So it was writing about writing and studying writing and thinking about how writing works. And once I unpacked those sentences, like word by word by word, why is it man here? Why is it eunuch here? Why is it servant here? You know, and I examine every single word and I'm like, well, I can examine my own words. And if I know how to do this, I can craft the sentences I want to craft. Right. Tell me more, please. I mean, there's, I want to ask a question, but I'm like, just stop. Yeah. Tell me, tell me more. Cause taking apart the sentences in what way? I think when we read something, we have, a, a general sense of it, like it speaks to us in some way. Mm-hmm. I have this memory of being in a workshop in college and we were writing personal essays. I think it was a journalism class, but there was mm-hmm. a, a segment of the journalism class where we tried to put ourselves in the essay and um, okay. talk about what, what we were seeing. So, so someone was writing about the experience of attending a football game at the college. And just like describing the scenery and so forth. And when she read it aloud, the class was paying a lot of attention. And so then, you know, you come to the part of the workshop where you want to compliment the person on exactly what you liked so that they have the positive and negative feedback that is actionable. So someone started deconstructing the sentence and like was trying to point to like, well, this page I really liked, actually this paragraph, actually this sentence, actually this word. And so when that feedback came through, it was kind of funny because it was like, it started off as a compliment and then the the target of the compliment sort of vanished. It was like, well, I liked your piece, but I can't <laughs> right. point to the exact word that I liked, but 
roughly on these pages I liked something. And it, it was actually a learning experience for me, observing that, because we do have a sense of what we like in the aggregate. Like, we'll be watching a movie and we're just like, I really like this piece of the movie. I don't know, I'm just happy. But if sure. you try to point to the exact frame of the movie you like, it disappears. Mm-hmm. And that's really hard to figure out as an artist because if you're the one who's making the movie and you want to know what frames to put in your movie, how do you pick which one? And it's it's like, it's a relationship. It's it's about what comes first and what comes later and how everything's like how everything in the first part of the movie is a background that sets up the climax of the movie and also about who's watching it because right. the different people in the audience are going to have entirely different reactions and, and maybe it's a high energy movie and you don't want to watch it after work because you're exhausted. Maybe you just want to watch sure. it on a weekend. Like it's, it's so um, variable and individual, but, but anyway, that's what I think about when I think about how we, how we pick things apart because in one sense, the essay is made of words, and you do have to have good words, just like you have to have good bricks when you build a house. Like, the house is made of bricks. I don't know what to tell you. Like, if the bricks are crumbling, your house is not going to be good. Right. But it's also, like, the the quality of your house is not just the sum total of the quality of your bricks. It's about uh, how the you bricks, them right. and yeah. whether it's the right house for you. <laughs> because what's a good house for you is not a good house for someone else. And that's what I play with all the time when I when I think about um, writing a sentence. If there's not like an objectively perfect sentence, it depends on everything that came before and everything that's coming after. Where I'm, where I came from, where sure. I'm going, who's reading it, who I'm talking to. Right. Oh, I love this actually because I do something when I'm writing something. I will. I'll put together like a sentence and I want to make sure I'm using male, female the way I want to. And then man, woman, the way I want to. But then like you step back some and you go, well, am I making the point that Mm -hmm. I wanted to, you know, would it make more sense not to use the sex, but to use the gender because it makes the point better. And then I look at dumb things. I don't know why I do this, but like it makes it, I can't have two paragraphs that start with the same letter. (laughs) <laughs> really? Yeah. That is like sequential. I mean, you know, because otherwise I could only have 26 paragraphs. But like if I, if, I, if I have something that says I such and such and such, the next paragraph can't start with I such and such and such. It has to be, you know, something else. And even if it's just like a transition, so to say like, however, I such and such, I'll do that. Oh, that's so interesting. It's a, well, you know, it's a... I don't know why I do it. So it's looking at things that I think, things that I know, like probably nobody else notices. But it, but it's, it's, it's again, it's like this holistic view that that you like. I, I crafted four great paragraphs, but they all start with the same letter. Is there some way I can change it up so that it, every time you go from paragraph to paragraph, it it gives a different impact. Because, I mean, I'm sure you've read things, you know, on Medium where, where it's, I got up, I went, I ate breakfast, I took a shower, I brushed my teeth, I such and such, and you go, okay. I mean, you know, it's sentence after sentence that sounds identical. And after about four of those, you continue reading them, and then you start losing it, or at least I do. Yeah, I start losing interest. So I I didn't. It is interesting to think that you that you want to look at word by word, but the bigger point is to do it holistically. You know, what ends up being the piece of art that you're shooting for. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you think of that as an artistic constraint? Like, like something you do just to have an exercise that you're striving for, like a, as a creative impulse? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, in part. Um, yes, in part. So, when you at, when you use the word constraint in particular, I don't remember where I saw this, um, and I can't remember the exact phrase, but the idea of constraints 
like having a constraint improves creativity because you have to find some way to, to get around it. And, and so that, um, I think I'm saying this badly. There was, um, there was an, a conductor and composer who, whose name is now escaping me. I can't believe it. But, um, cause we even have like a CD. It was night on bald mountain that, that he conducted, but, um, Oh gosh, his name was in my mouth, my mouth yet again. Anyway, the point is, he Leonard Bernstein. There we go. He he was quoted saying, "A good piece of music is is first of all one good idea, and then not enough time to develop it." Oh wow! Because if you don't have enough time, then you'll finish it, right? And mm-hmm. and you'll ju- you'll go, you know what? I'm not going to spend two months working on this one small passage, you know, in the piece, I'm going to, I'm going to finish the piece, you know, I'll put the whole thing together and look more at a macro level than at the, the micro level. And I mean, one of the things that you had written to me is, is something similar to that, that it's, it's, um, I can't find it in the notes. So I'm glad I, glad I brought it up, but you know, happy accidents you had mentioned, um, you know, the, the ability to, to look at what you've done and go, yeah, good enough. So to return to your question, is it like a constraint? Yeah, sometimes it is. And sometimes what it does is, is to like, to give me not enough time to do it right. I think is the way to put it. So I I think it was Leonard Bernstein who said that pretty sure. Not not enough time to do it right at the detail level, but forcing you to look at the macro level. Yes. Yeah. And, and with music, like, that's huge because you could spend, you know, it, depending upon, you know, the type of music. I mean, I don't play classical music, but like when I have ever recorded something, like maybe there will be, you know, there will be one word in a vocal or something that you go, dang, I wish it didn't sound like that. But then you go, but it gives it some character. And, and sometimes it's good to have a guitar tone that you go. Mm-hmm. It's kind of flat, but it means like maybe, you know, when you've got a flat guitar tone, you've got to change reverb or something and you change stereo imaging so that so that it adds, you know, something to it. It's exciting. And then, yeah. And then sometimes you get to a point where you go, yeah, the tone's not good, but I want to finish this. And and then you play it for. So this is the best part, because you play something for somebody or you give a, a piece of work to somebody and they read it or they listen to it and they go, that was phenomenal. And you go, yeah, but I didn't like this one piece. And they go, what do you, t-? like, I don't even hear it. Like, what are you talking about? Um, it's like that with writing too. Well, at least, you know, for me, I'll go, this was a weak section and somebody will go, I don't, it was fine. You know, there was one other thing I was going to, I wanted to say, but, but respond, please. If you, if <laughs> on that. Yeah, I, I think I wonder sometimes when those happy accidents happen, if they were really intended all along. Like mm-hmm. some some part of us actually meant to create it that way and is happier with it that way. Yes, right. We just weren't aware of it. Right, right. That's a Bob Ross thing, isn't it? The happy accident. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think so, yeah. Yeah, he did that when he was painting. Okay. The, there yeah. was a... There was a phrase you used. You said because you you were supposed to provide feedback to to these writers, and so um, sometimes, well, the way you would put it is, you said sometimes you'll look at a a movie and you'll go, "Gosh, this is great," but you can't really pinpoint exactly why. And unfortunately, like, doesn't that sometimes that's sometimes kind of useless, like a little bit useless feedback. Because, you know, I've had I've had people read something or listen to whatever it is. I'll do something creative and they go, yeah, it was nice. Hmm. And I go. Nice. I mean. Any particular part nicer than the other? No, the whole thing pretty nice. (laughs) And I go. Okay, dang. But sometimes I like that feedback because <laughs> you just go good. If you liked it, fine. Mm-hmm. So depends on the feedbacker. <laughs> feedbacker. 
But sometimes you don't have to pick apart the compliment. Sometimes they really are just happy. And they don't need to understand why, they're just enjoying the experience. Um, right. Yeah, but sometimes as an artist, you're wanting some specific feedback. Like you're wanting mm -hmm. an audience that actually knows how to pay attention and has a bit of an idea of how the sausage is made, really. And it's going right. To talk about that. Right. The, that's so I, of course, on that line, because sometimes because sometimes if I'm talking about like a song that I hear uh, somebody else's song, um, you know, I'll say, oh, I, li I like how Lady Gaga is big on this. And, and I feel somewhat dopey, like using Lady Gaga is like this this sort of vocal example. But, you know, she will sometimes have like a growly kind of sound. And then, um, then a very smooth, um, you know, singing kind of sound. I, like even, even um, it doesn't matter what song. I don't want to go into songs, but but she'll even put them right next to each other. And I got to figure, like in concert, you know, like they're separate tracks, right? Because she's, she, you can't change your throat that much, you know, in the middle of a chorus. But. Um, but that always gets me. So I'll go, gosh, I liked how she did this and then did this. And and I've had purple, purple. It's always on my mind. I've had people go, why do you even, like, who cares? It's like two lines in a song. The song's got a good beat and you can dance to it. Quit tearing it apart. Hmm. But those are, I don't know, those are the kinds of things that I, it's like those are the small pieces that end up sort of, come in together to make you get the brick house you know it's they're good quality bricks but then out overall you go and it's decent architecture i don't know i hate brick houses but you know you go and it looks pretty whatever if you like brick houses <laughs> sorry to <laughs> if you're a brick house i didn't mean to offend you sorry but no <laughs> so the brick houses over here <laughs> good so I don't know. It, the 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 feedback the feedback sometimes is is great because you will hear somebody who knows how the sausage is made, and you go, "Oh, that was perfect. You got that reference. You got that joke or whatever." And then there are people who just go, "Yeah, it was cool," and you go, "Okay, that's good enough. Leave it at that." So, <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Any more on that one? Because I can quit <laughs> at any time. I'm remembering also an experience I had recently. It was a couple of years ago. I was writing an essay on the movie Nightmare on Elm Street. And to oh, write gosh. my essay, I had to watch the movie very attentively because I was oh, trying sure. to write, write some ideas that were mostly about my life. It was partly a memoir, but I also wanted to connect it with the movie. So can, I started I, watching wait, the movie really you, intensely. Your life is like Nightmare on Elm Street? Because... <laughs> Something was. There was, there was oh, an gosh. incident. Um, yeah, I wanted to weave that movie into my memoir, so I did. Okay. And I, I remembered it fairly accurately. But the funny thing about remembering Nightmare on Elm Street accurately is that the movie makes no sense. When you really examine it, the situation is kind of nonsense. The yes. characters do not really have coherent relationships. The chronology is all off because the movie takes place over the course of about a week, but there are like three missing days right in the middle, and it isn't really clear. And also it involves not sleeping, so it's really hard right. to figure out. Right. I think there's a palm tree in the middle of it, but it's supposed to be in Ohio. Like, all kinds of stuff makes no sense. Okay. <laughs> the dialogue is really incoherent. Um, the backstory is supposed to explain things and it just opens more questions. So, <laughs> but as, as, as I think you were saying, um, on a macro level, it's a really cool movie. It is. And so it occurs to me, like, on the macro level, there are certain kinds of stories, like, People have analyzed, for example, the hero's journey. That there's a certain mm -hmm. structure that tends to show up a lot in a lot of right. Hollywood right. movies now these days because people are used to a certain story arc. Um, and in movies like that, I think if what people want is, say, a certain hero's journey or a certain kind of horror movie, mm -hmm. like they know what they're looking for and they're just going to be happy when they get it. And they don't yes. 
need to worry about the details necessarily and the details like all the little bloopers are actually kind of what makes it cool because like subconsciously we absorb that there's a palm tree in Ohio and we're not even aware that we're looking at that but that's like part of what makes it unsettling and and we come away sort of scared or confused or saying I feel like there were more details I didn't pick up on everything it's it's all the the quirks that Mm -hmm. they're like rough because the the artist didn't have enough time to smooth out all those details and really make it consistent. Right. And maybe they changed right. something at the last minute because they wanted this prop, but they didn't have it or the prop broke. So they just, they did some other way. One cool thing I learned about the making of Nightmare on Elm Street, um, there's one scene where the girl is running away and she's, she's, she's kind of like moving jerkily like in a nightmare and it turns out when she was filming she was actually injured because she she injured herself while running on set and so she sprained oh her ankle God. and she was running with a sprained ankle and that's why oh, it looks geez. that way it's what it actually looks like if you actually sprained your ankle but but you're looking at it as if it's fictional and as if she's pretending right. to have sprained her ankle right. and it's, it's stuff like that like the you're you're watching it on one level in this macro sense like i want to be watching a horror movie and then there's all these details that are discontinuous and not fixed but it's precisely that you like you didn't put in the time to fix them that that's okay that's what makes it what it is yes I, i'm gonna tell you too i absolutely adore nightmare on elm street <laughs> it, it was it was like a big turning point in in horror films like a like a major turning point you know that friday the 13th less so but Nightmare on Elm Street made horror cinematic, I think is how I want to put it. Because before that, like, look at, you know, old Dracula films or even worse. You look like look at old Hammer films, right? Like, you know, things, anything with Christopher Lee was campy. And this was horror not as camp, but horror as like actual expression. And it, it was like this turning point for um, for for horror I was way too young to have watched it in the theater, but um, in any event, um, yeah, like that in Hellraiser. But hell, if you watch the if you watch Hellraiser now, you'll do the same thing. You'll pick things apart and go, "Gosh, this is a terrible special effect. That's really bad." Like how you know? But it does add something by being not absolutely perfect. I think is mm-hmm. is you know. Just because I happened to see it recently, my my son, um, he ha- he wanted to. Do you remember the movie Tron? Let me try this again. <laughs> do you no. remember Tron? No, I didn't see it. Oh, you didn't? Okay. So I saw it in the theater. It came out like the same year as ET, and everybody I knew went to go see ET. And I'm like, well, I'm going to watch this computer film because I'm a dork. All right. So it was like the eighty two, eighty three. I don't even know, but. Um, what was neat so they made a, a new one and in and in the new one and i mean it's like 25 at least years later i don't remember when it was made but jeff bridges is like way older right so they used so but this is maybe 10 years ago that it came out i don't remember exactly so the computer like animation technology and the the de aging whatever you call it wasn't really great and so when you look at at jeff bridges in you know, when they show Jeff Bridges as like young, it's terrible. I mean, the well, it's not terrible. Looks great. Sorry, everybody in Tron Legacy. But that that actual look of the look of being obviously computer generated added to it because like they're in a computer and you go, oh, well, no wonder it looks like it's generated by a computer then. Because that was one of the things about Tron that you go, how come everybody looks totally natural? You know, they got little lines on them, but they just look like people. You know, here there were people that you go, ah, it looks totally computer generated. So I don't know. I felt like I had, I had a point there and I think I missed it. Pull that part out, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I have one more question I want to ask you, if you got a sec. Because you just wrote something. Here it is. You just wrote, well, it was three days ago, sorry. Um, But you wrote something. 
<laughs> I know me too. That's why I had to pull it up. But you just wrote something where you used tarot. Oh, so right. divination. And I'm, I feel like I, I think, and, and I try, I think of, um, you know, tarot also is like a method of exploring identity because you have to sort of shoehorn your story into the story that the cards are, are telling. How about if I just stop there? That's the way I see, I see tarot. Well, how do you see it? Well, do you see it um, more shoehorning, like like feeling constrained at telling your story through the cards? Is that what you're saying? I think that's a great way to put it. Because, yes, I, I feel like... Um, I don't want to use the word shoehorned. You, you need to look at the cards and have them integrate into your story. I mean, depending upon what the story is. You, you know, there, there's... Mm. If something is going to happen... The, and the cards are going to show it, the interpretation is what makes it valuable. It's not the cards. It's not, you don't go, oh, five of pentacles, wasn't that important? What does the five of pentacles mean in the rest of what you're talking about? And and so that's what I mean. Did, was that enough? Yeah. So So you might have something you want to talk about and you might have a general sense of how you want to talk about it but you pull a card and you're like well that's not the context in which i wanted to talk about it and how do i say something relevant about that card right right yeah so i guess i i like having those kinds of prompts because you can take an image say um the fool is, is a fun card in tarot because it can mean unknowing, but it can also mean a childlike innocence or it can mean being really foolish and laughing at yourself or having people laugh at you or, or not seeing sure. what you're stepping into. Um, and there's, there's different ways to look at that. And so when you think of it really broadly, like being a meditation on knowledge or uncertainty or everything that surrounds us and we're not aware that it surrounds us, but it's there or even like our own younger selves when we were aware of less. Um, that's, that's a broad area that can sort of apply to any question or any story, because in any story, you can be like, well, what don't I know? How is yeah. this person or this character making a fool of themselves? Or what, what might show them to be foolish if it were to happen and catch them unawares. Like, what are they going to yeah. be surprised by? Right. Or what are they going to learn in the future? Or what are they remembering in their past that they were like, oh, I should have known. Now I know better. Yeah. Um, so I like looking at the cards with broad meanings like that. And I think it's interesting the way that people write the explanations of the cards, because usually they're very careful not to say, well, Death always means literal death, and that's it. If you draw right. the card death, you're going to die in five minutes. Sorry. Like, they're pretty careful not to say that because it's clearly yeah. not true, and like the tarot would disprove themselves immediately. Like If, if you right. knew that if you pulled these seven cards, it would mean that you were going to win $7,000 in the lottery tomorrow, it would just be disproven, and everyone would say tarot was boring. But usually they'll say, like, well, the card refers to some general idea about money and it could mean you're going to get a lot of money or it could mean you need a lot of money or something's going to happen with money and so it's a fact that there's just a lot of money in the world and something is always happening with money of course and yeah if you think about money you can come up with a lot of ideas because you might not have been thinking about money at that particular moment and you're like oh well when i think about the role of money in this situation like that's controlling why people are working certain jobs, which is a huge part of their yeah. life. Yeah. If they're not working, then that's because maybe they have enough money not to work, or maybe it means that they're just in really, really bad shape because they're not working and things would be better if they were working. Or like, it just, it reminds us of certain things that are important that sometimes we leave out of our analysis. So if people ask the card, say about a relationship and you draw a money card, it's like, oh, well think about how money is affecting your relationship. Right, right. So I think it broadens the story that we can tell. It, it does. I love you used the the word um, prompt, 
and I think that's a great way. I think that's a great way to think of, of cards like that. To, it's, it's you know it's seventy eight different prompts that you can use about your life. Um, I always love when I um, when I get like the eight of swords. I, I always love that, right? You know, the, the typical Rider Waite card, you know, has somebody with their hands bound behind or loosely bound behind or with like a, a, a blindfold that's come sort of slipping off. And then there's the eight swords around her. And, uh, oh, is that the typical Rider Waite? I'm thinking of, I'm describing the, the picture in my, in the deck that I typically use, which is the mm -hmm. Druid craft one. But in any event, um, you know, the, the the idea that, that there's a sense of, of being trapped, but usually it's it's being trapped from your own from your own action or inaction and you know, you could get out of it and so you kinda go, Well what where am I trapped? You know to to use your to use your examples, I mean if you look at your life, say you are working a, a job, you go, well, I feel trapped. And you go, yeah, you feel trapped because you're not going to get a promotion. You can't get a, a a pay increase. You can't – your manager's a weenie. I don't even care. You don't There's have so a job. There's to be trapped. Yes. You know, and, but if you're not working, you can go, well, look at how I'm, – I'm trapped because I don't have enough money to buy whatever. And so anyway uh, – um, yeah, the idea of prompts, I think, is so is so powerful, so so spot on, because that's I mean, that's really that's really what we need. And I think this helps us develop not just our own identity, but like awareness of, you know, our surroundings. Gosh, we should do we should do a thing on tarot now <laughs> on divination. That would be cool. I would like that. Um, do you know the person who wrote the book? I believe it's called The 78 Degrees of Wisdom, Rachel Pollack. Yeah, Dying Rachel Pollack. I, yeah. She did, I know. I, yeah. Um, I've, I've recently started to get into her work a little bit. Mm. It's really interesting stuff. So, so maybe that would be a topic for the future. Oh, for sure. No, I think so. Because I... There are other th Mary Kay Greer has that great um I can't think what it's called but it's on my it's like tarot for yourself I think and the idea of of your birth cards and cards for the year and you know so much that you can use that that lets you look at a situation from a lot of different perspectives which which is very important mm -hmm. I think for you know anybody so it shows us all the angles and dimensions of ourselves. Yes. Which I believe is ultimately what art ends up doing too. You know, the purpose mm -hmm. of, of having art. So, all right, now we're going to have, we'll have to plan another one. So, <laughs> um, all right. So we're, we're like looking at an hour here. So let me go ahead and, and, uh, and say thanks so much, Tucker, for taking the time out of your day, your, your evening, I guess to to talk to me awesome awesome conversation thank you so much amethysta <laughs>